long, really, in my in my mind. But I want to, uh, and, and uh, God has been sh- sharing some things with me, so I want to share the message this morning. But um, the title of my message this morning is "Positioning Ourselves for Anticipation." Positioning ourselves for anticipation. You can say Amen. amen. That's a good title. Amen. Positioning ourselves for anticipation. Anti- How many like that title? I, was, I thought it was a good title. I thought it was a good title. Anticipation. Anticipation is, uh, I mean, something we're looking forward to something. Another word for participation is expectation. So if you turn your Bibles this morning, I want to share some things with you about anticipation. I, I remember back years and years ago, this goes back probably 150 years or more in my life. <laughs> Seems like anyway. I started out in life as an electrician. I wasn't always a pastor. I was an electrician. I followed the footsteps of my family from generation to generation to work construction. That's what I was a construction worker. And I remember going through my apprenticeship. And I was working with an old electrician, and, and he was teaching me the ropes and teaching me what to do. And I was standing there and waiting for him to give me instruction. In other words, I wouldn't move. I was just didn't want to touch nothing because I was just a first-year apprentice. I would just, and, and, uh, but I observed different electricians and what they're supposed to do. And what he said to me, he turned around and says, what are you waiting for? And I says, I'm waiting for you to tell me what you need. I'm here to get you what you need. He said, anticipate. (laughs) In other words, if you're paying attention to what's going on, you should be anticipating my next move before I tell you what the next move is going to be. In other words, you're following the, the process and the procedure. And so I remember that word, anticipation, as something I was scolded for, for not having. I needed it. So I needed to work on my anticipation. So a lot of times I would just have two or three things in my hand just in case he needs this one right now or that and there. Yeah. And I'm anticipating because I'm going to be needed. So praise the Lord. Paul says something about this in, in Philippians. If you don't want to turn your Bible this morning, first chapter in uh, Philippians. And Paul says this in verse 20. Uh, I'm reading out of New King James. He says this, according to my earnest expectations and hope. That's what he's talking about. According to my, uh, my anticipation and hope. So two things working together. <clears throat> that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether in life or death. For to me to live is Christ, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I put this out, I started looking at this thing, I said, you know what? I said, the value of something is determined by what someone is willing to pay for. The value of something, okay, is determined by what somebody is willing to pay for. So I'm going to ask a question this morning. It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer, but what does Jesus mean? What's, how, what is the value of Jesus in your life? Because the value of Jesus in your life will, de- will, will depict on what you're willing to pay to follow him, what you're willing to give up, what you're willing to do. Amen? Praise the Lord. So I, I just I want to throw that out as a question, but it was, was something that was on my, on my way. But he mentions also the word hope, expectation and hope. Focus on those two words, expectation and hope, Paul is saying. In other words, my whole life is based on expectation and hope is what I'm basing my life on. He said, to live, and he said, no, if I, my, in my life or my death, he says, I will always have these two things, expectation and hope, or anticipation, as we put it. So positioning ourselves for anticipation. I, I picked this up at, at, at Hebrews 11.1. 1. This is a, a scripture everybody knows, uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, but I read it out of the Amplified Bible. Now, the definition for hope, I want to just t- hone on that word for just a minute. The definition for hope Hope is the joyful anticipation of good. Hope is a joyful anticipation of good. Amen. So, oh, and I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 1, but I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. This is kind of interesting. I know it very well out of the King James, but out of the Amplified Bible it says this. Now faith is the assurance, the deed title confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and evidence of things not seen, the conviction of the reality, faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Did you get that? Let me say that last part again. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. I like that. Faith comprehends as fact 
Amen? What cannot be experienced by the physical senses. That whole verse was worth it just for that part right there. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many know that our friendship with God, I said this before, our friendship with God will only go as far as His Lordship has already been. Amen? God's looking to be your Lord before He's going to be your friend. Praise the Lord. Amen. This thing of anticipation, to position in ourselves, to be looking forward to something, looking forward, anticipation. Well, uh, here's, here's the thing. People have been disappointed because God doesn't meet their expectations or their anticipations. So what happens is they've been disappointed. Most of the time we're disappointed because we never asked him what he said. We're always wanting, looking at what we want him to do for us. How many know, let me make this real plain, that um, we don't, we, we serve him, he doesn't serve us. Amen. Amen. God is not obligated to meet your every little need or every little uh, whim, I should put it that way. He does promise to supply our needs according to his riches and glory, according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So there's a couple of things in that. That's another message. I don't get too, too deep into that. But I noticed this anticipation. In Mark chapter 16, I looked this up. Mark chapter 16, Jesus actually rebuked his 11 disciples for not having anticipation. He rebuked them. Well, okay. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 14. It says, Later Jesus appeared unto the eleven and sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. He called it unbelief and hardness of heart because they didn't anticipate. Uh, that's tough. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he was risen. In other words, everybody was concerned when Jesus was crucified. His disciples were concerned because they thought they were going to be next. Then when the rumors went around, because they thought it was rumors, it was actually fact, that Jesus rose from the dead. Now we're in bigger trouble because now the Roman Empire is going to be down on us and we're surely going to die over this thing. And a lot of them wanted to flee. Amen? When Jesus appeared to them, he says, didn't I tell you? In other words, I told you what was going to happen. So basically because they didn't anticipate, they didn't have the anticipation, they didn't have the expectation of Christ raising from the dead. If he rose from the dead, there's no doubt that he's the Messiah. And that all power is given to him in heaven and earth and, all, and things under the earth. So praise the Lord. So he had all power. So they were, they were subject by their fears to an inferior power. They subjected themselves by fear to an inferior power other than God. Praise the Lord. Amen. I got looking at this. I got thinking about this thing. This is going to seem strange. But I'm going to do something I have never done in all my years of, 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 of preaching. I have never taken the 23rd Psalm and taught on it. How many know what the 23rd Psalm is? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, we will recite this thing. It's probably the most uh, familiar scripture of all scriptures, other than, that, other than John 3.16, probably. I mean, we, we, we have it on postcards. We have it all. At, but have you ever broke it down? This week, I'm out, and, and I'm, I'm asking the Lord. It, it started on Monday. I was asking the Lord, uh, what should I, and he kept bringing this up to me. Uh, and he's the 23rd Psalm. Um, I'd go and I would look at something and it would come up 23rd Psalm. Everything. So I said, okay, Lord, I got, I got the message, 23rd Psalm. So we're gonna, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm to you um, out of the New King James, and I'm gonna also, which is what I study out of, and I'm going to uh, read it out of the Passion Translation also. How many know uh, uh, Psalms? How many think they know it? How many, think how many have it memorized? Raise your hand if you got 23rd Psalm member. Yeah, there you go. I'll praise the Lord. Matter of fact, if you don't, uh, in our foyer, uh, before you get to the new columns that we put up there, all the decorative stuff, you'll look on the, as you're walking out on the right-hand side, you'll find a big picture about Ye Long, and it's a, it's a tapestry of needlepoint. My mother-in-law, Diane's mother, uh, uh, did this needlepoint how many years ago? When she, she was 60. Okay, so the... the <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Anyway, so she's since been gone, believe the Lord, did this. And what it was, it's the 23rd Psalm. You can see it out there. Lord is my shepherd. And she, she did this in needlepoint, all these little, little things like that. Praise the Lord. I have another one in my office that my grandmother uh, had done. Uh, that thing's got to be about 100 years old, uh, she, where she did the, Lord, the Our Father. And, uh, and, and so, but anyway, if you want to look in, uh, you should have in your Bible the 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm. It's a psalm of David. David is probably the most inspirational figure of the Old Testament that I can think of. 
David has inspired me in so many ways to look at his story because he was just an ordinary guy. He was an ordinary guy that loved Jesus or loved, loved the Lord. He just he couldn't stop from loving the Lord. Did things wrong, but always went back and repented and went back to the Lord. And the Lord just, just said, of all the people in the Bible, he said, David is a man for my own heart. Only one he ever said that about was David. Amen? 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me to paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff. Note those two things. I'm going to go back over this and get, break it down for you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <clears throat> you shall prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Absolutely, Pastor. Yes, we love that 23rd Psalm. Does anybody know what it means? Okay, well, hang on, because after this session you will. Amen? You'll get a, a good insight. Let me read it out of the Passion Translation. Uh, it says the 23rd Psalm, of course, is one, verses 1 through 6. It says in verse 1, Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd, and I will always have more than enough. He offers a resting place in his luxurious love. He tracks me <clears throat> to an oasis of peace near a quiet brook of bliss. Verse 3, where he restores and re revives my life. He opens the door before me, the before me the right path and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Verse 4, even when your paths take me through the valley of the deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me for you already have. Your authority is my strength and my peace and comfort your love the comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. Verse 5, he says, You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You become my delicious feast. I love this part. Even, even when my enemies dare to fight, you anoint my, you anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my cup overflows. And the last verse says this. It says, so why would I fear the future? Only the goodness and tender love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterwards, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. That's the Passion Translation. Amen? Let me go back to the, to the other translation. Let me go to the things. One of the things he says, this, this being a Psalm of David, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I heard that someplace before. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, in John 10, Jesus said this. He said, I am the good shepherd. So basically, this is... This is Thousands of years before Christ, David had the idea that the Lord is a shepherd. Jesus echoes this word now in the New Testament in John 10. Matter of fact, John 10, 1 through 14, talks about, Jesus talks about the sheepfold. And what he talks about as far as the sheepfold, the sheepfold was a fenced in area, and there was a gate, and there was a gatekeeper who watched everybody's sheep, and you could put all flocks of sheep in the one sheepfold. But what happens when the shepherd comes up, opens the gate, tells the gate, if you open the gate, he would make his sound or the sheep would recognize his voice or his signal and only his sheep would come out from all amongst the other ones and follow him. That's the shepherd. And Jesus said this in John 10. He said, a thief doesn't go through the sheep, goat, but climbs up another way. And he said, the one that tries to go another way other than through the gatekeeper is a thief and a robber. In other words, who tries to get the same benefits as the shepherd who, deserve, who, who, who is entitled, okay? 
is a thief and a robber. In other words, we're going to go by another way. We're not going to go through the main gate. We're not going to go through Christ. But Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. He also said that thing about being a shepherd. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not a hireling. Hirelings flee at the sign of trouble. But he says, I don't. Hmm. We only got past the first four words. The Lord is my shepherd. Are you here? This is what it means. He says, I shall not want. That means we don't lack for anything because the shepherd sees to it that we have everything. Verse 2. He makes me lie down. In green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. Isn't that nice? Now, if you ate grass, wouldn't that be good? (laughs) But we don't eat grass. This is the metaphor. He's he's symbolizing it. But what we do have, he says, he makes me lie down. When I looked up that into into what it actually means from some of the commentaries, all like this, what what he is saying, he says, to lie at rest after the toil of a battle. The Lord has me rest after the toil of a battle. Green pastures, we don't eat grass. Sheep eat grass. It's a metaphor, again, green pastures. Dwellings or habitations. What he's talking about is a dwelling or a habitation. So let's read it again. He makes me lie down after the toils of a battle. I'll read it with my notes. In green pastures, dwellings and habitation, he leads me beside the still waters. In other words, the quiet places to where there's an abundance. Clear waters are waters that flow. Clear waters are waters that are silent and are calm. So I have the provisions that I need. How many know what else is represented by water? Not turbulent water, quiet water. Washing of the water by the word. Are we here this morning? Praise the Lord. Let's continue on. How many want me to continue on? Okay. Verse 3. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Let me stop there at the word soul. Yeah, just the word soul. Because what happens to be in New Testament Christians, we think the word soul uh, is strictly talking about mind or intellect. Right? We have a... Paul mentioned we're, uh, we're a whole body, body, soul, and spirit. So there's three parts, a physical, but, and we often think about that soul as, as in, my intellect. So in other words, I, uh, uh, he, 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 rest, he restores my intellect or he restores my good feelings. He restores that. That's not what it means. The word in Hebrew, matter of fact, this word for soul is found, I looked it up, is found 753 times in the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word, and what it means, it means the whole person, our entire life, everything attached to us, encapsulized. Everything, our physical being, everything about us, our friends, our relatives, everything that makes up our life, that makes us us, our personality, our, our intellect is included in that, but it's also our very life in which we lay down for his cause. He restores my entire Entire life. So it's a lot stronger in the Hebrew, I think, than what we, what we get an idea about. Amen? He leads me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, don't let me hot, hot, fast forward on this one. Amen? In other words, I started looking at this. For his name's sake. It kept going over. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. What do we have uh, uh, that Jesus has given us for his name's sake. He's given us his name. In other words, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. At his name, we can use his name and cause deliverance to come on a person who needs deliverance by the name of Jesus. There is no other name more powerful than the name of Jesus. All authority is encapsulized in that name. In other words, in situations of apparent defeat, how many has ever had a situation of apparent defeat? We don't look like we're winning. We look like we're, f- we're falling off. Understand something. What God does, he sets us up for greater victory. The devil, now that God doesn't bring these things on us. We know that. Jesus was a perfect example of the love of the Father. He showed us what the Father is about. And Jesus went around healing people and delivering people. Amen? He didn't cause, the Father didn't cause the situation to come about and Jesus coming on to do it. Now, that wasn't it at all. 
Man, he only did what the Father told him. He only did the will of the Father. So it was the will of the Father. If Jesus healed, it was the will of the Father for us to be healed. Now, something go for, short circuits from heaven to earth a lot of times to the manifestation, but I'll guarantee it's not on his end. It's always on ours, somewhere along the line, regardless of what it is. I don't always understand everything either, but the fact is this is what we, our Father sets up. But, so every situation that we get into that seems to bog us down, in other words, for his name's sake, what God does is set us up. When the devil comes and attacks us, he sets us up for a greater victory. So every little thing that affects us, every little thing that tries to hurt us, kill us, or put us aside, God sets us up for a greater victory. If we will withstand what he says, let me go and say it again. He restores my soul. He leads me to the paths of righteousness. In other words, not my fault, not my condition, but righteousness. He leads me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, at the name of Jesus. Amen. At the name of Jesus, that power hits me. So what happens when affliction comes against me at the name of Jesus, I conquer that battle that sets me up for a greater victory of a, even a larger battle down the road. Understand this. We live in a fallen world. And as long as we live in a fallen world, things are going to happen. Amen. Christian or non-Christian alike, it doesn't, it, it's no different. If, 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 but the fact is, with Christian, we have been given a, he restores the soul for his name's sake. It's for his name. He restores us. In other words, something that was taken from us is now given back for his name's sake. And for his name's sake, we have a greater victory. Our circumstances always come into a place of breakthrough because Jesus is our Lord. So wherever we have a circumstance, we are being set up for a breakthrough because Jesus is our Lord. Well, wow, let's see, I only got past verse 3 so far. I'm only halfway through this thing. Praise the Lord. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How many know a shepherd doesn't have a rod and a staff? He has, a, he has one instrument. The one instrument has two names. Why did he have two names? Everything in the Bible is for a reason. So I started looking it up. Matter of fact, the Amplified Bible, if you read the Amplified, it'll tell you. That's where I got this from, from the Amplified translation. The rod is his protection and the staff of his guidance. Let me share something with you. When a shepherd, remember he's talking about the shepherd. He has his staff, okay? What happens, it usually has a hook on the other end for guidance. Amen? but it also has a thing for whacking a wolf that wants to take his sheep. Jesus took out, or, um, uh, David took out a lion and a bear as in part of his shepherd's duty. Of course, he used a sling, uh, a little more powerful weapon, but the staff is the same thing. It can ward off things, but it can also you hook and guide the sheep along. So what he says, rod and staff, when he says, your rod of protection, your staff is guidance. Your rod is protection, and your staff is guidance. Let's read it again. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. In other words, the Lord is with us, even in the shadow, even in the shadow of death. He says, Your rod of protection and your staff of guidance shall will comfort me. Fear and anxiety, oh, this is my notes, this is my notes. Fear and anxiety is often the problem of forgetting who we are. Fear and I'm going to say that again because it was good. I, I, I should need a bigger amen right there. Amen. Fear and anxiety is often the problem of forgetting who we are. Okay. Fixed in the lordship of Jesus, many times we tend to exaggerate the size of our problem so that our anxiety seems logical. Many times I'm I'm still not getting the amens I'm satisfied with here. I'm seeing a lot of quietness here. Praise the Lord. Come on, this isn't a funeral. Yeah. Amen. All right. Many times we tend to exaggerate the size of our problems because so our anxiety seems logical. Amen. I mean, no, you'll fear something that there should be no reason to fear at all. We always fear of something going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. So therefore, we're afraid of something that isn't even happening. And then when it happens, we're so proudly prophesied. 
I knew that was going to happen. Oh, yeah, pro be proud of prophesying there. Oh, yeah, that works, works out great. Now your anxiety can, can, can relax because now it's, it's, it's been uh, logically solved. Hallelujah. Am I talking to anybody in this church? Praise the Lord. You prepare, oh, do I dare do this one? You prepare a table before, before me in the presence of my enemies. You notice the back and forth here. He says, you anoint my head with oil and your cup runs over. I'm going to get that one in a minute. This table. This table, this, this, this got on me this week, this table. Okay, I'm looking at an exchange. When I started doing this study, God said, I was repeating this to myself. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And God says, no. He says, speak it like a declaration. Do the 23rd Psalm like it's your declaration. You're declaring this is over yourself. Okay, I'd say that. Lord, you are my shepherd. I don't follow anybody else. I don't follow another voice. I shall not want, I shall not have any needs that you have not, that's out of your reach, that you cannot supply. And I receive that. You make me to lie down. Even, Lord, sometimes I don't want to. But I declare, if God is calling a lay down, I'm going to do it. That's a declaration. He restores my soul. Absolutely. I used to be this way, and now I'm this way. Like they're lumping. I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. Amen. Keep your opinions to yourself, and I'll keep mine to mine. Praise the Lord. Amen. He restores my soul. God is the one that can restore all things, including our soul. Everything attached to our life, because his soul is about our life. God is the one who restores. I'm going to say it again. God is the one who restores. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10. Jesus said, I came to give him life and life more abundant. God gives life. The devil steals. Okay. I feel better. Thank you. Amen. Where do I leave off? Verse 5. You prepare a table for me at the, before my, in the presence of my enemies, not when my enemies leave in front of them. God himself, now there's an exchange here. David says this, and God does this. I, I'm this I, I see this in God, and God does this for me. And I see this, and there's this exchange back and forth. The entire 23rd Psalm is an exchange between David and his, and his Lord. What is our exchange? Maybe we should come up with our own 23rd Psalm and come up with an exchange that's going back and forth. Anyway, that table, he prepares a table. I love this. This is, this, is the, this is the meat of it right here. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. All in verse 5. He prepares a table. I'm going to take you back to a story that David told. How many know David? I'm going to go pretty, pretty quick in this. But David had a, uh, had a friend of his, Jonathan. They were more than friends. They were covenant, covenant buddies. They, they cut covenant together. Jonathan was Saul's son. Amen? Uh, uh, Jonathan had a son, which means in covenant terms, because David and Jonathan had a covenant, the covenant in which they cut together, what they had together, I mean, they did the hand cutting, they did the, the bleeding, the whole thing. Uh, they, they had the sacrifices. They made promises. It's, it's, it's more than an oath. It's more than just an agreement. It is life for life. They combined their, combined their lives in whatever, whatever strength one has became the others. Whatever one strength that had became the others, back and forth. In covenant terms, the next born or the oldest next born of the of, or only living relative of that first of, of that one. So in other words, this would be Jonathan's son was named Malphibosheth. Malphibosheth was in line for a covenant he didn't even know about. Are you getting into this? David became king. Saul and Jonathan were killed at the Battle of Gilboa. David was hunting down and looking for the family of Saul, any living relatives of Saul, particularly Jonathan's offspring. In searching with his army and everything else, they thought gloom and doom was coming upon Mephibosheth. Matter of fact, when Mephibosheth was just small, he had a, a, a nurse uh, taking care of him, and uh, she heard David's men are coming looking for you, and he, she ran and she fell, and he was lame. He was crippled for life because she fell with him as a, as a, as a child. Mephibosheth scared to death that he was going to die, that King David was going to find him. He goes to a place called Lodabar. Lodabar is out in the wilderness. It's like, nobody's going to come out here and look for me in Lodabar. 
so he hides out there. David says, search the country. Turn it upside down. I want Mephibosheth. In the mind of Mephibosheth, he thought, this is it. David wants to kill me. His men finally track him down. And they, they don't explain the situation. That's up to David to do. All they do is they seize this man and they take him to the palace. He's standing in front of the king. He falls down and he pleads with him and shows him honor. And David says, what? Stand up. He says, I'm offering you right now a place at my table. He says, I had a covenant with your father, Jonathan. Now that covenant can be yours. It is up to them whether they receive it or not. Jesus said he's the firstborn of many brethren. It's up to us to re receive or reject that covenant. But if you reject that, if you receive that covenant, your life now is at the king's table. That's what the table he's talking about. The Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Melchizedek says, what? He says, all the days of your life you can eat at my table. Your household is taken care of. Any land that you lost is given back to you because of that covenant I had with Jonathan. He said, but you are here. Guess what? He was crippled. But when he pulled up to the table, his lameness was covered because of the table. God has put a table before us. And all your weaknesses and all lameness, he says, come to my table. This is what, let the enemy see who you belong to. Let the enemy see what covenants you have. Let the enemy see what power dwells within the kingdom. Let the enemy see. We're not hiding this. We're putting it all for all to see. This is the table that God has prepared for us. In that table is family. In that table is fellowship. Not individualism. Melchizedek couldn't get that table outside the palace. He had to come in the palace in communion with David to have that table. But he had a right to the table as long as he showed up. He has to show up. People, you have to show up Amen. where God has placed a table. And he's placed a table in this church and other churches around. Show up to the table and receive the covenant that God has given us. Come to the table. He's still preparing the table. God himself is preparing the table. And as himself is inviting us to the table. And we, Melchizedek, limping around and crawling around, trying to escape God and all this other stuff is nonsense. Because Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. He, he paid the price for the covenant. Now the covenant is ours for the receiving. Amen. Ours for the receiving. And the table is the fellowship with God and fellowship with the Father. It's a relationship that we have with him. At the table, we talk. At the table, we... we, 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 we Bind, bound, uh, bond as family. At the table, we, 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 we tell our problems. We have solutions. And so at the table, everything is settled at the table. Remember the table. Remember the family meals we used to have years ago? Where the family got together, where they had separate paths all day long, but they got together at the table. The church is God's table today. He's prepared a table for us to come together to be united from our separateness out into the world, which is where we're supposed to be. But then we have a place to come together and be part of what He has given us and be part of what He has done for us. He's prepared a table before me in the presence, before me in the presence of my enemies. The table's for me. He wants the enemy to see. He wants the enemy to see. The table is placed, a place of interaction, fellowship, relationship, family intimacy, closeness with God, an ongoing testimony of God's goodness in front of the enemy. Don't let anybody stop you from that table. Don't let anything keep you from that table. It's not worth it, whatever it is. Come to the table of the Lord. Many times all we see is the enemy, and we tend to be... Uh, uh, to defend our circumstances by the enemy we see instead of by the Lord who is seated at the table. Many a times we discern our life and we, do, we, we uh, define our life by what we see around us, by what we own, by what we've done, what we hear. But we shouldn't. We should be defining our life as bringing us around the table, God's table. Melchizedek found 
freedom at David's table, not demise like his father lied to him and told him, or his grandfather lied to him and told him. Amen? Evidently, Jonathan didn't drill in far enough because they knew what covenant was back in those days. Today, we're, it's, a, it's an anomaly for us, but to them, it wasn't. David was honoring his word. He was a good king. And he said, the Lord, I, just like I, I mean, David could say it this way, just like I presented a table to Mephibosheth, my God gives me a table <laughs> to sit down. He gives me a table to where I can commune and fellowship with the Lord. He gives me that table. Amen? That table. It's important. Every attack or setback of the enemy is to remind us that we are designed for a greater victory because of that table. I'm going to read that again. This is my notes, but I'm just going to read it. For every attack or setback of the enemy is a reminder that we are destined for a greater victory. I don't care what you're going through today. I don't care how big it seems. We win this, and guess what? For a victory, there's a greater victory on the horizon. But what happens is we tend to get our eye on the problem and the fear of the problem, and we never see the victory. Amen? Belly up to the table, and let's talk it over with the Father. He's prepared the table. What's on that table? Oh, let's go back. He says, I'm at the table. Perform me in the presence of my enemies. The devil's watching too. He's watching how you react to the table. He knows as long as you're in fellowship with God, he's got no chance. But you push yourself away from that table, you neglect that table, and your devil's next entree. Okay, in the presence of my enemies. We said, God wasn't hiding them from the enemies. He was putting on a show for your enemies. This is what these people have. This, is the, this here, come to my table. What you're trying to do to, to destroy these people, hey, they got me. Bring it on, knucklehead. Bring it on. You touch them, you're touching me. This family. That table says we're family with the Most High God. Oh, I love it. He anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Do I dare say this? Shepherd. I think I've taught on this before, but let me go ahead again. Oil. And they would anoint Aaron with oil, and the oil would run down into his beard and so on and so forth. Sam, uh, David was anointed by Samuel. The prophet, he poured his oil, horn of oil, over his head and it run down. Amen? And it had a fragrance to it, had it, and it soaked into him. And that anointed him to be the next king. Amen? So you got the picture, right? What does that have to do with a shepherd? Glad you asked. A shepherd always carries a flask of oil with them. When sheep eat along the, this is talking about natural shepherds now, when sheep eat along the, along the pastures, Flies get up into their nose and they lay eggs and the eggs turn into worms and they go and they eat the brain of the sheep. And when, it, when that happens, the sheep will bash his head against the stone to try to get rid of the sensation of the worms eating into the brain. Eventually, those worms will kill the sheep. So what the shepherd does, he pours oil on the head of the sheep until the flies can't get in because of the oil and it protects the sheep. The anointing of God is set to protect you. Amen. Not just empower you, but to protect you. Amen? He anoints my head with oil. Why the head? Because we're bombarded with thoughts all the time. Thoughts and ideas, thoughts and ideas by the enemy that'll eat up the brain and just drive you up a wall. You listen to the devil, he'll drive you insane. Amen? So what happens, the anointing oil of God, he anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. In other words, this table, I'm anointed. At the table, I'm supplied for. At the table, there's an anointing, there's a cup that keeps running over. In other words, my cup never gets empty. You ever, how many of you ever said this in the family? And, you know, grandma's like, keeps filling your cup. My grandmother always had to... It didn't matter what time of day, if I showed up at my grandma's house, she automatically figures I showed up because I was hungry. 
But Grandma, I'm fine, I'm fine. No, no, no. It, you wouldn't hear. You had to have something to eat. And when my grandma is usually pasta or something like that, <laughs> or chicken soup. She made chicken soup that was out of this world. But my grandma had to give me something, and she would not rest until I ate something. So I used to eat something just to shut her up. <laughs> but that was it. And she was happy, and I was full. <laughs> but my cup brought it over. In other words, if I, as soon as I get done, one, she would have something else on the table to try to shove in front of me. Get, there was always something there to eat, something to, to fulfill. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Verse 6. Amen? Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Bold faith. I heard another preacher say this isn't mine, but I like this phrase, so I wrote it down. Bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. Bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. In other words, you can be loud about your faith, you can claim this and claim that, but if there's not that quiet trust on the inside, you're just spouting off. Amen. That quiet trust is what we're talking about, the anticipation of the Lord. Positioning ourselves for anticipation. We pull ourselves up to the table, we're positioned. We're in position. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's the 23rd Psalm like you've never heard it before. So the next time you want to religiously read the 23rd Psalm, say, Pooey, I'm not going to do that. Amen? Let me, let me close with this, because basically the disciples did get it right. I, st I started out with a rebuke. The disciples did get it right. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus is telling them, do not depart from Jerusalem, the place where they thought they were going to die. Did you hear that? They thought they were going to die if they stayed in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was all in an uproar about the resurrection. Jesus said, no, stay right there. What was happening? They were in hiding, and Christ was trying to line them up for a larger victory. But they had to be in the place where Christ said to be. If they went to Galilee, it wouldn't have happened. They're from Galilee. They weren't from Jerusalem. They went out of there. But they didn't. They gathered in the upper room. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 50 days after Passover, fully come, they were all one place in one accord. Then the Holy Spirit came. Peter was out of that. He preaches to tell everybody what happened, and we got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not drunk. It's only the third hour. I don't know what he meant by that. But anyways, he said, and he goes to the temple that week, and he sees a man that was completely lame begging for money wasn't allowed in the temple because he was, couldn't walk, kind of like Mephibosheth. And Peter looks down, he reaches down with his right hand, he says, silver and gold I have none, but I have to give you, I give you the name of the Lord. And he says, rise up and walk. The man rose up and walked. He picked up his bed, he was dancing, and they all danced and praised God going into the temple. Amen? Amen. In Jerusalem, Peter became the apostle over Jerusalem. Peter, James, and John had the whole city upside down, and they tried to lock them in jail, and an angel let them back out again. They couldn't contain them. They couldn't do nothing with them. What was God, Jesus, what was God doing? He pulled up to the table, and God was giving them a bigger victory, a bigger victory than trying to hide out and duck out and trying to stay away from, from sight, stay out of sight. He said, no, right out in plain view, preached right out in the open. He gave them a bigger victory. Nobody could touch them. Nobody could ke catch him and keep him for very long. Amen? Why? Because God sat there. In Psalms 5, David writes again, he said, My voice, I'm reading verse 3, he said, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning. I will direct it to you. I'll direct my voice. In other words, not complaining, because when we're complaining, we're, we're directing to everybody but God. Sometimes. He said, No, I'm going to direct my voice to you. He said, and this is how you're going to know, I will look up. That is the posture of anticipation. I will direct my life to you, and I'll look up. I'm not seeing all around here. I'm not seeing what's coming up. I'm just looking up. 
I'm focused. I'm changing my focus, in other words. Luke chapter 21, verse 8, Jesus mentions this. He says, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh, draws near. Amen? When many just look to survive, God is wanting us to thrive. And if we're still looking in survival mode, we will never see the will of God performed in our life. Because God isn't looking for survival. He's looking for us to thrive in everything that we do and put forward. Amen? Thriving not according to what we, we see. Amen? Look at what he does. We're living in the last of the last days, I believe this. The first Timothy, I put this in my notes, I'm going to end with this. The first Timothy says, now the Spirit speaks expressly. This is Paul telling Timothy, who's going to be the pastor of Ephesus. He said, now the Spirit speaks expressly. That in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. There. That's what we do. The opposite. <laughs> the opposite. Amen? No hypocrisy. Nothing but truth. This, uh, latter time, we're not going to... Doctrines, the word for doctrines is teachings. We're not listening to the teachings of the devil because remember... He prepared that table before me in the presence of my enemies. We only have one enemy. We, Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You, you are, we're not enemies. People are not our, our problem. He said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers in high places. So the only enemy that we have is one we cannot see, which is Satan, who's just real, whether you can see him or not. And God has prepared a table in the presence of our unseen enemy, showing us that we are family. Touch them, and you got me to answer. Now, Satan answered to him one time before. He was in heaven as Lucifer, and he was thrown out. And Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning out of heaven. It was that quick. It was a, it was a quick battle. Then when he tried to tempt Jesus, you know what he tried to tempt Jesus with? Of who he was. Prove to me who you are. Now, I don't have to prove to you, I don't have to prove to anybody who I am. I'm seated at the table. Can't you see I'm seated at the table, you knucklehead? So the next time the devil comes, he says, I'm, sit I'm sitting at the table. Shall I read the 23rd Psalm to you again, all six verses? Amen? You know what the Lord says, I'm at the table. Amen? I'm family. I'm family. The family is at the table. The table is for the family. We come together at church to be in the presence of God where two or three are gathered in his name and spirit is, is, is there in the midst. Why? He's bringing the family together to sit at the table. This church is God's table and we're all invited to sit at his table right in front of a city that is bent on going to hell and does everything it can, but here we are in the presence of our enemies, and God prepares a table for us. I'm out of time. Praise the Lord. How many got something out of the message this morning? Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me this message this morning to share with all of you. This thing has impacted me like nothing has before. I can, I can remember in a long, long time, but this has been in, in, impacting. I pray that this message changes this church forever. It changes the ones listening by live stream. It changes your heart forever. Never look at the 23rd Psalm in religious eyeglasses again. Take off the religious spectacles and see what God is really saying in that thing. It's one of the most powerful Psalms that David ever wrote. It, 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 depicts, it depicts a relationship that we absolutely all yearn for to have with the Lord that is right there. We can have it. It's only our brains that tell us we cannot. And we're not smarter than God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. How many got something out of the message this morning? Amen.